Welcome to the very best part of my broadcast week. You know, on this program, we love books. We love podcasts. We're going to merge them together in kind of a self-promotional way, I grant you. But that's okay. I like to promote myself occasionally, and I like to promote the great work of other people. And in this case, the two things we're going to be promoting fit together seamlessly. So let me talk to you about what I'm discussing. So, Lise Wheel is our guest this week. Lise Wheel is a best-selling author. She's a former federal prosecutor, Harvard Law grad, although there are lots of good lawyers who didn't go to Harvard, but there are really a lot of good ones who did. Her most recent book, the paperback came out in May of this year, is called A Spy in Plain Sight. That's the book. What's the podcast? Well, I'm glad you asked. The podcast is something I'm incredibly excited about. The first episode dropped yesterday on all podcast platforms. You can see here, if you're watching on Paramount Plus or CBS News Streaming, a little graphic representation of it. What does it say? Agent of Betrayal, the double life of Robert Hansen. That is the seamlessness of today's or this week's episode. Robert Hansen. The book, A Spy in Plain Sight, is about Robert Hansen. The podcast, Agent of Betrayal, is about Robert Hansen. Lee Sweel, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Major, that was great. Look how seamlessly you put together that self-promotion. I love it. <laughs> so tell me about your book project. Tell me about your experience as a federal prosecutor, uh, the family relationship you have, other federal prosecutors in your family, FBI agents in your family, and why this story put a hook in you. Sure. I'm a third-generation federal prosecutor. My grandfather before me and then my father were federal prosecutors. And more than that, my father was an FBI agent. So I grew up hearing stories about cops and robbers and good guys and bad guys. And of course, when you're a kid, you don't realize that these are real. But as I grew older, of course, I, I did. You know, that these, what my dad was talking about were real stories and they were incredible. I mean, I think that's with a mother as an English teacher who was correcting my grammar and the dad as an FBI agent slash federal prosecutor, I was destined to become a writer, right? <laughs> There's no choice. Um, and my dad had always talked about Robert Hansen as a black mark, a big black mark on what was otherwise an FBI that he loved and that he had put so many years and into and had so many friends that were there and, and, and still remain, um, that Robert Hansen was this character, this enigma within the FBI that had, that had tricked the FBI for so many years and had pulled the wool over theirs, whatever you want to say, had, had broken down the culture of trust that is the FBI. And so I heard about this guy, and then I became myself a federal prosecutor. I worked with FBI agents. And I thought upon, you know, just coming up with the topic for the, my next book was, I got to find out more about this story. And I got to find out when there's now been some hindsight, 20 years, mm -hmm. you know, since right. his arrest when I started yeah. the book. And that to me just made, you know, what can I, what else, else can I discover about this guy? How can I move this story forward? And it it's given away in the title of your book, A Spy in Plain Sight, but let's not bury the lead, uh, Lise. Robert Hansen, in the annals of American spydom, is espionage. Right. is one of the two or three most damaging spies in the history of the United States of America and by far the most damaging FBI turncoat, essentially oh, betrayer absolutely. of the FBI. Absolutely. He's called the most damaging spy. And, you know, it, 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 it's hard to uh, equate that, right? right? Okay, you can say $10 billion in secrets were lost. But Major, how do you put a price on the lives that he cost? You know, all of our Russian assets. And people have asked me, Russian assets, why do we care about, you know, the, the people that are over there in Russia? You know, why do we care about them as Americans? We absolutely care because as much as we glean from politicians and now drones and all of this other, you know, medium of, of being able to discover um, things that are going on with our, you know, our enemies, let's say, mm -hmm. Russia, China. We need those, we need people power. We need the people on the ground, the assets, to be telling us, the FBI, the CIA, what's going on in real time. And that can only come from people. And so when Hansen, as over as he did over these 20 years, was giving over the identity of our Russian assets, and they were, 
you know, let's face it, being executed because of that, we were losing the assets. We were losing people. You can't put a price on that. And we were losing information. And it's hard to put a price on that as well, Major. And there are uh, time periods that are worth evaluating, Lise, because for some in this audience, they don't have a lived memory of the Cold War right. and what the Cold War tensions were like and the deeply adversarial relationship between the then Soviet Union, it's the Russian Republic now, but it was then the Soviet Union, the United States government, and the day-to-day, -day, almost hour-by-hour -hour competition for granular pieces of information about the other to gain an advantage, however right. small that advantage might be. And that's wherein this statement you just made about the value of human assets loomed so large because those human assets could cut through the clutter, cut through other things and tell you things that were valuable in real time. Losing those assets in the Cold War was a very big deal. Very big deal and, and so brutal. I mean, the first chapter of my book is about a guy called Top Hat, that was his name, and the brutality uh, with which the Russians executed him and videotaped that execution. This was during the Cold War, videotaped that execution to keep others, you know, in line and, and to say, this is, this is what's going to happen to you if you dare betray us. I mean, the fact that, that Hansen had that information approached the Russians, let's not forget about this, during the Cold War, as he's a brand new young FBI agent. This is what calls me so much, Major. One of the things that calls me is that he approaches them in the height of the Cold War. He doesn't say, I'm Robert Hansen, I'm an FBI agent, you know, I have this information for you. But he gives over the information of Top Hat and others, securing his position with the Russians who, you know, just gobbled him up and loved it and embraced him. And, you know, we can talk about that, but that just ranks me, rankers with me so much mm -hmm. that he could do that and betray his country so early in his career and during the height of the Cold War. And uh, let's explain to our audience something I know you explore in the book, and we certainly explore in the podcast. Again, the podcast, Agent of Betrayal, Lee Wheel's book, A Spy in Plain Sight. So in those circumstances... When you are trying to impress, if you're an American, the Soviets back during the Cold War, it's not like you just walk in and they accept it and say, oh, this is great. We'll take anything. There's always a sense of hesitation. Why? Because they don't know whether or not they're being set up. They don't know if this exactly. is a provocation. There is a means by which you have to demonstrate your worthiness. And for them, the Soviets, if you want to become an agent in place, that's the terminology for them. They've got to believe you, A, have access, B, have the goods, and R, C, reliable. And right. one of the ways you do that is you give them stuff of such pristine value off the top, which, to your point from a moment ago, is precisely what Hanson did. Absolutely. And so they trusted him as much as the Soviets would trust an American pretty much off the bat. And he continued to deliver, as we say, for, for you know, for 20 years. But... This information that he gave at the at the top was such damning information, and ex and the execution you know came forward um, that they they were in, they were in, and they wanted more, and they wanted more, and they they really played him, played to him, played to his insecurities about not being wanted and about not being loved. Do I sound whiny? I, I, I am whiny because that, because that just, that, that, you know, like, I mean, Major, how many people do you know in their job just, you know, don't feel appreciated, don't feel like they're being treated as a star enough? Uh, lots, you know, that's a very common thing. But the difference is, that Hansen had these secrets to sell. And so he could sell them and he had an outlet for that to be, to be ingratiated and to be loved and to be, you know, courted as the Soviets did. So we're going to get to the whiny side of Bob Hansen <laughs> in a moment. Elise Wheels, our special guest, her book, A Spy in Plain Sight, my brand new podcast, very excited about it, Agent of Betrayal, more on the takeout on the other side of this break. He was also kind of fashioning himself as a James Bond character, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save those damsels in distress.
Welcome back to The Takeout. Lise Wheel is our special guest, best-selling author, well-known legal commentator. Her book, A Spy in Plain Sight, dovetails with my brand new podcast, Agent of Betrayal, The Double Life of Robert Hansen. So we'll get to the whiny side of Robert Hansen in a second, Lise, but uh, paint a picture for my audience of who Robert Hansen was and what he was like and how he was regarded. Right. I mean, from an early childhood sort of perspective he grew up you know middle class chicago he, his father was a cop um as you've described you know tough on him i mean things like you know he tried to get his driver's license at 16 his dad quashed that you know um he finally did get it but i mean things like that i mean just mean you know hard on him nasty this is the guy who didn't really want his son to succeed is my theory i mean you you mentioned wrapping him up in a blanket i mean just really bad stuff right yeah the mom there's a, sort of there's a there's a there's a story uh in the in the podcast that we tell about some transgression that robert hansen committed as a young child not like 10 or 11 or 12 13 we don't know the exact age and the right. punishment was his father wrapped him up in a floor rug and kept him there for some period of time right uh, just imagine that, that folks that's that's kind of heavy it, it very heavy. I mean, he had some heavy things happen. In addition to that, uh, in sixth grade, he lost one of his best friends. Um, the the friend was I think was out playing. and got a concussion and died from that concussion. And and think how traumatic that would be. Um, he was close to his grandmother. Always was, even when he went off to college. Very close to the grandmother. The mother sort of plays in, but you know, kind of is cow cowing to the father. That's also the generation that role um yes in any respect i would say he had he was abused as a child right we would say that now but major you know and this is comes from my days as a federal prosecutor almost everybody in pre-sentencing when i was going through the pre-sentencing reports of a, of a criminal had abuse as a child and i'm not excusing it i'm certainly not excusing that but it's also not an excuse for what he did going forward. And the same thing with the Unabomber. I mean, all of these guys, and they're mostly guys, um, had some kind of screwed up childhood, right? Uh, but people pull themselves on their bootstraps. Anyway, don't even get me started there. Um, <laughs> again, you know, because I'll just go on a rant. But again, as a child, think about this. He was really a geek, a nerd. You know, he would approach girls at the park with Jack Hoshauer, his best friend. And, you know, are you all right, ladies? Are those are those boys bugging you? You know, the, the girls were quite happy that the handsome guys were bugging them and didn't want, you know, nerdy Robert and his, <laughs> and his buddy Jack around him. But he was, yes. like, you know, he kind of had that nerd complex. And, and yet he was also kind of fashioning himself as a James Bond character. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to I'm going to save those damsels in distress. I'm going to be, you know, driving the fancy car and having the and having the lovely ladies. This is all per Jack. And it's, it's and it's, you know, and Hanson would say the same. Yeah, that's what he was. But so you have this abused child mm -hmm. meets geek nerd, which I love nerds, but, um, you know, sort of nerdy, geeky. And then this inflated sense of ego about being a James Bond character when you're early on in childhood. Right. And I get why then he would leave the accounting, which is what he, you know, kind of the degree he sought, to go for the FBI, which of course is glamorous, has that glamorous allure, tough guy allure. Right. And then he gets to the FBI and how do his colleagues see him? <laughs> um, <laughs> I know the answer, but I want you to tell yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And I know you know, one or two of them, um, you know, thought he was great, uh, super smart in computers. Yep. Actually, everybody thought he was super smart in computers, right? He That was kind of his in, in IT. And even today, Major, the FBI is great at a lot of things. Computerization and IT ain't part of them, you know, and certainly weren't back then. I mean, right. they're, they're bad. I can give you so many examples. Late so 70s, early important. 80s, he was a pioneer, even among computer geeks, and he was a revolutionary within the Bureau when it came Absolutely. to computers. Yeah, and, and, and most guys in the FBI kind of go in there because they want to, let's face it, they want to knock some doors down, they want to knock some heads, <laughs> you right. know? And so, hey, if Bob wants to do all of that IT stuff, let him go for it. Let him do that. Um, but, you know, he was, he, 
he just didn't get along well in the sense he didn't go to social events. And if he did, he would be wearing his, you know, macabre sort of dark suit all the time. Major, he even slept in black pajamas. I don't know if you knew that. I mean, wild, right? <laughs> so he didn't, he, yeah, he just wasn't going to go out with the guys and drink beer. You know, the, the FBI guys are sort of, a, you know, the beer drinking guys, the CIA, they're sort of the scotch drinking guys. Right. Um, and, and And he just wasn't a part of that. And I think that kind of that feeling of him knowing that they thought he was a joke fed into what we were talking a minute ago mm -hmm. about his feeling like, wait a second, I'm the star. I'm this Bob Hansen. I'm super smart. Why aren't you doofuses, FBI agents, recognizing that? You know, you must be pretty dumb. Right. So you have two things going on, as you indicated. One, the sense of not belonging. Uh, among the nicknames he had was the mortician. <laughs> He had this drab, sort of off-putting personality, kind of the smartest guy in the room complex he had. But he also had this fantasy projection that he was James Bond-like. And he had this actual skill, which at times proved itself useful to the Bureau in computers, but he felt it was largely unrecognized. And you take those two things and suddenly, I mean, very quickly in his FBI career, a chip begins to form on his shoulder. And that chip on his shoulder manifest into a malevolent sense of, well, I'm going to do some stuff and I'm going to get in this game, meaning the game. And that's what people call it, as you well know, right. in the espionage world. It's a game of betraying his country. Right. And as you said, that happened early on within the, within the first couple of years of his career, because he, he, but he had access to all these secrets. He had access to this information in large part because of where he placed himself uh, physically, but also because of this expertise that he had, you know, let Bob get into the computers, let him do that. Well, what does that mean? That means he has full range, full gamut of all of the information, not just in his unit, but other units. And, you know, the fact that he wasn't caught in a sense, I, I think was in part because of that knowledge of computerization. I mean, at one point, he even hacks into a colleague's computer, right? Yes. yes. And, you know, they the FBI figures it out. And he goes, he says, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, I did that. But I was just showing you, FBI, how bad your computerization system is and how it needs to be, you know, revamped. I mean, come on, you know, <laughs> really? <laughs> Plausible at one level, but implausible at so many other levels, especially in, in retrospect. And Again, to rem remind the audience the time we're talking about here, 80s and early 90s, yeah. when, when computerization at that point in time is really only viewed as this maximalist convenience. The idea of being able to lurk through data and find things isn't really top of mind. It's like, oh, what, what, what can he find over there? He's just, he's just goofing off with the computers. Exactly. No. Exactly. Actually, he has eyes on in places you can't even comprehend. And that is an insight that Hansen had. And it allowed him to be an effective, damaging, deadly agent in place undetected. Yes. And I'll just even make a further point on that. This is kind of the juxtaposition that between 85 and 91, I think that's about, about the years, he copied off. 6,000 pieces of paper on the Xerox machine on the fourth floor. Now think about that, right? So we talked about the computerization and how he was able to get into it, but how did he get the stuff out, the, out of the FBI and to mm -hmm. the Russians on these drops? He was sitting there, you know, lottie da with maybe a cup of coffee, you know, because it might have taken him some time. Yeah. On the fourth floor. Right. I mean, it wasn't exactly high tech when it came to that part of the operation. Standing at the copying machine, <laughs> doing deadly business for the Soviets, right there in the open under the fluorescent lights in the FBI headquarters. That's Lee Wheel. I'm Major Garrett. Lisa's book, A Spy in Plain Sight. My brand new podcast, Agent of Betrayal. More of our conversation in just a second. I think it was Ronald Reagan that said, you know, trust but verify. They didn't do the verifying part. <laughs>
Welcome back. Lise Wheel is our guest coming to us via Zoom from her beautiful home in Santa Barbara. Lise Wheel is a native of Yakima, Washington, as I mentioned, Harvard Law grad, a former federal prosecutor, father and FBI agent. She has a book. Uh, the paperback came out in May of this year, Spy in Plain Sight. Interestingly, it's about the same topic as my brand new episodic podcast, investigative podcast, Agent of Betrayal. The first episode dropped yesterday. It will be available on a sequential basis, one episode a week for the next eight weeks. And we are very proud of it, my team and I. So, Lise, um, let's talk about this plain sight part of it. Because you mentioned as we went to break, Hanson standing at the copier, making this stuff out, the drone of the copy machine. It's actually highly classified documents. Walks out of the bureau with regularity doing that. One of the people we interviewed said, you know, at that time, at the FBI headquarters, public libraries had stronger security protocols than <laughs> FBI headquarters. That's why he could walk out with documents. Nobody right. ever looked at anything or asked any questions. What do you got in there? What are you doing? So that's one of the plain sight aspects of it. Tell my audience about some others. I think the major one that I would think of is uh, trust. That when you're in the FBI, you are part of the federal family. And you are trusted. I mean, yes, there are tests and everything's to get into the FBI. It's tough. It's rigorous and all of that. But when you're in, you are trusted to be, you know, part of the team, working together on the same side. Now, I, you can understand that, right? Because you go in to make an arrest of somebody and you're, you know, you're carrying firearms, you got your partner with you, you have to trust that person in the trenches. And that carries forward into pros prosecuting a case, putting a case together, investigating. You have to trust the people that you're with. And it wasn't, I think it was Ronald Reagan who said, you know, trust but verify. Mm -hmm. They didn't do the verifying part, right? All of these years that he was in the FBI, the, uh, the, the trust of him remained. That was, I think, enabled in part because all those years, 20 years, no lie detector test, mm -mm. No, fi no financial uh, upgrade, uh, you know, security audit. clearance, no on it, none of that. I was on my fifth year major of being a federal prosecutor. They had to redo my security clearance. You went back to my kindergarten teachers, you know, what was the least like? I mean, she was a crazy little girl, <laughs> whatever. They had to go back through all of that. Why? Because when I was hired, I passed the security clearance, but perhaps something had happened in those five years that made me vulnerable to being blackmailed. That's the reason behind doing that. So trusting but verifying, he that never happened with Hanson. So he was able to just carry on and no red flags were raised, even though, as Mike Rochford said, an FBI agent who was definitely involved in the investigation, there were all these puffs of smoke, but because of the trusting nature of the FBI, they were never really followed on. Right, there's the trust part of it. Then I think, Elise, it's worth suggesting that the off-putting part of Hansen's character mm. and demeanor, people just didn't want to deal with them. I mean, as you mentioned, he had a couple of really good friends we've interviewed, the right. people who re really, I mean, they didn't just like Robert Hansen, they were involved in his life and he was involved in theirs. and. They are sort of spokespeople for the other part of Robert Hansen that they don't want lost in the retelling of the story. And we give them full access right. to the microphone. But most people at the FBI, based on our reporting, just didn't want to deal with Hansen. Thought he was just a pain in the neck. And that off-putting part of his character sort of created a little buffer zone around him, it seems to me. Absolutely. He was never, because of that off-putting uh, part of his character, he was never going to be elevated to the highest echelons of the FBI. And I think he knew that, but that didn't matter in the access part of what he was doing because he had this computerization and they was allowed full access. But I agree with you 100%. Other than, you know, David Major, maybe an FBI agent, and Jack Hoshauer, who says to this day, um, even though Hanson betrayed him, that Hanson was his best friend. Mm -hmm. uh, other than a couple of folks like that, Everybody still like him. I mean, and you think about it in your in anybody's work situation. If you've got somebody there that you has to be part of the team, you're kind of stuck with them, but you just don't like them. Well, then you're not going to go out of your way to really focus on them. Right. And that it was that focusing on that would say, hey, you know what? It's been five years. It's been seven years. It's been ten years. 
-hmm. maybe we should look at redoing his security clearance. So I want to have you share with the audience something that is, there are many, many intriguing parts of the Hanson story. That's why there are eight episodes of the <laughs> brand new podcast, Agent of Betrayal. That's why there's a whole book from Lee Wheel. One of the intriguing aspects of it is there was something unique about the way Hansen dealt with his first Soviet, then Russian handlers. At least you know the answer to that uniqueness. Share it with my audience. Well, uh, Cherkoshin was his first handler. And he, again, we, he approached him uh, via letter. This wasn't, you know, there was no reaching out. There was no email or anything like that at this point. And he uh, offered all of this information, didn't identify himself as an FBI agent. But then when they started responding to him in this flowery language, yours, friendship, all of that, he would respond in, in a like manner, but always controlling the way that these drops were made. He was in control of the Russians. It wasn't the other way around, which I think is kind of unique in the whole spying gamut. Right. You mentioned a phrase earlier about his handler. And the idea in this world is when we recruit, we handle the recruit. When right. they recruit, they handle us. And what that handling means is you run that person. You run that. And one of the ways you best run that person, whether it's the Soviets running an American or American running a Soviet or a Russian, is to know a lot about them. And that is typically the way this works. Hansen would not permit that. He was right. for the remainder of that lifetime that he was a spy, a better part of 20 years, probably anonymous. Oh, there, oh, might have, there might have been some sense, but probably anonymous. And he wanted it to stay that way. That's a unique part of his spy craft. A hundred percent. I don't, the Russians didn't find out who Robert Hansen was and his identity as an FBI agent until the day of his arrest. Right. They found out with everybody else. And I think that is, I, I do believe that is, if not ultimately unique, very unusual, right? That it, that the handling uh, is reversed. And, you know, look, to give Robert Hansen props, smart guy. You know, he knew exactly what he was doing and he fed them exactly the information he wanted and he controlled it and, but smart, but dumb in the sense that, you know, somebody writes you a flowery letter, really? I mean, you know, maybe I'm too <laughs> cynical at this point, but I, that's, that, that ain't gonna do it for me, <laughs> you know? Um, and, but of course these flowery letters were also saying, and here's 10,000, here's 35,000, here's 50,000. Right. Here's some diamonds. Here's some other things. But I think right. you really locked in on something that's really important, least uh, because there is a deep psychological dimension to this. And we talk to folks, look, you cross the line. That's a big journey internally yes. and externally. And the Soviets, then the Russians detected very quickly that one of the best ways that they could keep this flow of information very valuable to them was to play to Hansen's ego. And they only figured that out, not by face-to-face -face meetings, mm -mm. only through these letters. But they got onto it quickly. And to your point, the floweriness of those letters did play to his ego. And to use a phrase I used earlier with you, put a hook in Hansen and kept him there. Absolutely. I mean, you know, there are a lot of reasons and motivations for people to spy, right? And one of them, the primary one, is money. And certainly Hansen needed the money. He had all these children. He had a wife that wasn't really working. They lived in Scarsdale, which is a fancy uh, suburb of New York for a period of time instead of living someplace further out. You know, he had all of these expenses. So money for sure. But Major, I don't think had he been embraced by the FBI that he would have even started this. I don't think money would have been enough of a motivator. I really do think it was a psychological need that we, you know, kind of picked up from when he was a child and to getting into the FBI. I mean, from his perspective, imagine that you get into the FBI. You've wanted this your whole life. You're better than your dad now, okay? Right, That's important. Right. And you get there and people are kind of, woohoo, handsome, <laughs> can you believe it? Yeah, that right. kind of thing. And you know it, you're a smart person, 
Right. So what do you do? You know, Bonnie, his wife, she's going to follow you anywhere. He's manipulating her. But that's not enough. I mean, Hanson's got a bigger ego than that. And he and needs so, something else. And we'll, we'll talk exactly. about that other part when we come back, because I got to hit a break here. Lise, Lise Wheel is our special guest. My brand new podcast, Agent of Betrayal, her book in paperback, A Spy in Plain Sight. Back in just one second. The ability to compartmentalize, and you touched on that, is so key to who Hanson is and what he did. Welcome back. Continuing our conversation with Lee Sweel, her book, A Spy in Plain Sight, my brand new podcast. First episode just dropped yesterday. Agent of Betrayal, The Double Life of Robert Hansen. So continue the conversation about these needs that Hansen had. And then I want to get to the contradictions, the things that Hansen led the people around him to believe that were not remotely true. Oh, my gosh. I mean, where do I start? <laughs> when, after after he married Bonnie, he converts to Catholicism. And as you talk about the podcast, it's not just Catholicism. It's Opus Day. And, you know, you, you had some folks saying it's more like a cult. I don't know that it's a cult, but it's a very strong sect and, you know, strong believers. Nothing wrong with that. No. Um, Willie Free went to, you know, the former director of the FBI went mm -hmm. to the same place he did so she church he did but so here's the outside world Hanson right I'm a devout Catholic I go you know go to mass several a day at least once a day I hate the commies anti-commie anti-commie this you know we've got a, a cross in his I mean in his office all of these things you know some of the women and that he worked with some of the secretaries were maybe engaging premarital sex you know that was a no-no to Hanson right. he would lecture them you know all of this kind of thing so to the outside world, he's a family man. He's got all of these kids. He's got a beautiful wife. Um, he lives a lovely. He lives a lovely life. He's strong anti commie strong religions, strong law and order, strong law and order. That's what he presents. Right. And the flip on that is what we've been discussing: the approaching the Russians and and and. and manipulating his wife in horrible ways. You know, the ability to compartmentalize, and you touched on that, is so key to who Hansen is and what he did. Uh, Dr. Charney talked about this, the psychiatrist that that interviewed him before his, um, before his sentencing, that we all do it. We have to compartmentalize. I mean, you know, you're not going to see me on this podcast walking around in my pajamas and brushing my teeth, right? Or yelling right. at the kids or anything like that. <laughs> It's a different thing, right? We all right. have to do it. But to this extent of the ability to portray himself in one way and then be a completely different person in another way, in an evil way, um, was something Charney had never seen, something I'd never seen. And I've prosecuted people and done this news for you know many, many years. I'd never seen it quite like this. And you mentioned David Charney, uh, not only the psychiatrist assigned to the Hansen case, but to several other prominent convicted spies in American history. David Charney, who had his voice uh, flows through our eight episodes of Agent of Betrayal for that reason, because he has this vivid memory of his interactions with Hansen, which, of course, is relevant to our story, but also this accumulated knowledge of the psychological intricacies of those who cross over. Americans right. who become agents in place for a hostile foreign power, almost always the then Soviet Union or Russia. And he talks about all of them having this characterization or character, characteristic rather of compartmentalization. But he says, Robert Hansen, even among this very unique group of people who are heavily compartmentalized, is the most compartmentalized psychological subject he has ever come across. Absolutely. And you see that. I mean, one thing that Charney said that I thought was kind of interesting is he said, you know, um, perhaps what the FBI will, could do, and they'll never do it, but perhaps what they could do is kind of give spies, nascent spies, a first pass, you know, a first pass saying, if you spy once, that right. there's some place you can go and sort of turn yourself in and we won't, you know, seek any retribution. Again, the FBI is never going to do that, but right. 
it's not that bad of an idea if you think about it. You know, that, that somebody could pull themselves back. I don't think Hanson would have. Um, so I don't think it would have been effective with Hanson. But it's an interesting idea anyway. Carney's point is that, just think about it. So you work in intelligence or counterintelligence. You're bumping up against all these temptations, all of this spycraft world. That's part of your job. You are immersed in it. And there are temptations, financial, psychological, and otherwise. And his point was, if you cross that line just a tidbit, just a smidge. Right. And it's a little exciting. But then you, wait, wait. So, no, no, I can't, I can't keep going. I can't keep doing that. But you know, if you turn yourself in, you are cooked. You're done. And so he says what that creates then is this gravitational pull. Well, I've crossed the line. I might as well stay there. Right. I'm never going to be forgiven. His point is, maybe under certain circumstances, we reevaluate that. To your point, I don't think the FBI would ever do that. I don't think the intel community would ever do that. But it is part of this thing. Once you cross that line, there is this pull that takes you deeper and deeper. Unless you're someone like Hanson, who I think made that move and was going to stay there no matter what. Yeah. And, and Major, I just thought of this point as, as we're talking through this. I know Hanson wouldn't have stopped. Why? Because he did have that mm -hmm. reprieve once. Remember, yep. Bonnie goes into his, his yep. sock drawer, finds 5,000 bucks. You know, she's worried at this point that he's cheating on her. Terrible thing, obviously, but that's what her worry is. I mean, this is going to sound like a joke, but it's not. I mean, she goes to him and says, you know, are you cheating on me? Here's this $5,000. He's like, no, 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 don't worry. I'm not cheating on you. I'm just fine for the rest of it. Yeah, right? I'm a phony spy. I'm telling them lies, oh. and I got some cash. Yeah, don't worry about it, but I'm not cheating on you. So they go to their priest. This right. is crazy. But Bonnie says, you know, it's a good Catholic. Let's go to the priest. The priest says, uh, it's fine, bad, but if you give us the money, if you give me the money, the church the money that you, you know, received so far, we'll be, you, it'll be a clean slate. Oh, come on. So that's, but that's what he does. <laughs> and he stops for a little bit. Yeah. And then again, he starts again. And, and we don't know, you know, whether Bonnie knew after that, we're not sure. But uh, my point is that even if the FBI had instituted something like go to the priest once and it's okay, he would have kept doing it. He right. would have kept doing it. Right. And uh, just so you know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when Robert Hansen was arrested, and I guarantee you the podcast, Agent of Betrayal, The Double Life of Robert Hansen, goes into vivid and memorable detail about how that all happened. We're not gonna be able to, to have time to get into that now, but I gotta keep something for you in the future anyway. <laughs> um, there were, this was such an earthquake within the FBI, <laughs> such an incredible earthquake, that two separate reports, massive reports were put together to look at all this. One by the Inspector General of the Department of Justice, and then one by the Webster Commission led by the former FBI director, William Webster. And you can read in that lots of rear view mirror stuff about all the mistakes the FBI made, things that should have seen, should have detected, should have put together, but didn't, which goes to the plain sight component of Lisa's book. And I'll just leave you with this, Lisa, because we're gonna have to go. In the annals of the FBI, as you know, Hansen represents two things that are diametrically opposed, massive failure, and then investigatory right. success. Yes. Their catching of him is just one of the best stories ever for the FBI. And they come out just smelling like roses because of what they did once they discovered that it was Hanson. But getting there, it's such a story. Such yes. a story. And you're covering it great. I can't wait to hear the next episode. So, Lise Wheel, thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much for being with us, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure you stay tuned for your takeout outtake, especially out. We'll see you next week. What drives me nuts in so many of these procedurals is they do things that would never happen in a courtroom. Welcome to your takeout outtake especially you know sometimes in this segment i will do a little bit more on the subject at hand and wait for the fun and games part no we're just going to get straight to the fun and games part <laughs> uh lease wheel is a terrific guest i've known her for years uh we were once colleagues um at a network that she might know on cable you can look it up um 
Lise, in this segment uh, of the Takeout Outtake Especial, we have three questions. We've asked nearly every single guest that's been on our show. I call them our three threshold questions. Take them in okay. whichever order you prefer. Most influential book in your life and why? All-time favorite movie? And if you are going to be flying back to the East Coast from your beautiful home in Santa Barbara and you're going to listen to your favorite music, your absolute favorite music, what kind of artist or genre is that most likely to be? Oh, my gosh. All right. I'm from Yakima, Washington, as you mentioned, and you said it correctly, which I'm just amazed at. Um, and yeah, nobody, yeah, people say Yakima, you know, all of this. So Yakima, wow, you got, you nailed it. Um, country music, of course. I, I put my iPads on, pods on, my little deer ear things, whatever, not, I'm not carrying my iPad. Uh, when I walk and I just listen to country music and uh, yeah. Yeah. That's... So would that be mostly modern country or would it be of the Hank Williams, George Patrick Jones Klein, that uh, kind of variety? Stuff. Yeah. But I like it all. Um, okay. I probably listen to more of the, you know, Garth Brooks, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, even Taylor Swift kind of gets into country. So it's sort of pop country. But yeah, country girl. Absolutely. Favorite movie. Oh, my gosh. I mean gotta be Casablanca right I mean I, love, I can watch that a hundred times that is uh, the most that is the most named movie on the is show it really? the, show's, the show's been going we are in our seventh year more than I certainly more than 300 episodes I don't know how many we lose count but Casablanca if we were to go back and have artificial intelligence which remember ladies and gentlemen is not artificial and it's not intelligent anyway if we were to have them to search our archives Casablanca would come up by far more than any other movie. Okay, okay, all right. So one that maybe not doesn't come up and is completely in a different genre, The Nutty Professor. <laughs> Fun, right? And as you, you know, I'm sorry. I like, I, I like yes. it. Yes, we like that stuff. So much no, I, I um, would not necessarily put those two together, Nutty Professor and Casablanca, <laughs> but that's a good combo. I'm, a, I'm a gal with a lot of reach, right? <laughs> This this Saturday at the Bijou, a double feature, yeah. Casablanca yeah. and the Nutty Professor. <laughs> oh, and you know, um, most influential book. book and why? I can't I can't even answer that because my mind always goes to uh, the most exciting thing that I've read lately, mm -hmm. and I would sure. say Yellowface, and I'm forgetting the author, a young um, Asian one. I'm forgetting her name right now. Um, but it was it was just such a it was such a fun book and a great book into different cultural um, visages, really. And having just um, attended the the wedding of my son and his wife, Annie Kai, who is first generation Chinese, um, I found it especially interesting and especially you know brought even more of her culture home to me. Wonderful. So whenever we have subject experts on the show, uh, I like to take the movie question one question deeper. So you're uh -oh. a former federal prosecutor. Tell me your favorite movie about the law and your least favorite movie about the law. Movies. Um, oh, 12 Angry Men. Okay. Uh, absolutely. I mean, to see that, uh, you know, that 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 progression of what happens to those jurors in a jury room yeah in a jury room because as a prosecutor other than being with the grand jury you're never really with um you know you're never really with the jurors right you're just always waiting you know the longer they take usually that's worse for the prosecution by the way i had a hundred percent record with my trials thank you very much <laughs> um but yeah that was so fun to get in the in the in the back in the in the background um, okay. Worst is probably some of the procedurals on TV and I'm not even a name, but you know, look, I'm, I'm watching suits. Everybody seems to be watching suits right now. It's right. fun, but what drives me nuts in so many of these procedurals is they do things that would never happen in a courtroom. And so <laughs> I'm sitting there trying to, you know, just have a nice calm evening and I'm screaming at the television. <laughs> yeah. Because at no. least... At least with Ally McBeal, you knew it was partly comedy. You knew it was yeah. a put-up. Yeah. Those of us yeah, who remember exactly. Ally McBeal, and I'm one of them. I, I do, too. She And she was sweet, and she was all kind of dorky, and I really, right. you know, I like that. But things like, even like Suits, it's supposed to be sort of serious. 
And, you know, we're going to have this client. Things Judges do things they would never do, allow evidence in that would never be allowed in. Right. And that bugs me. So I just, I can't, I can't kind of calm down when I watch those. It hypes me up more than calms me down. Well, we don't want Lisa Wheel hyped up. We want her calm no. and cool and collected. Lisa, calm it's been cool a pleasure. Collected. Thanks for your time. Again, her book, A Spy in Plain Sight, my brand new podcast, Agent of Betrayal, The Double Life of Robert Hanson. Lisa, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for the time. Thanks so much, fun.